I'm here with Ian Bremmer, who, of course, is the CEO and founder of, U of Eurasia Group and also G Zero Media. He is also a noted political scientist. Ian, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Alice. Sure. My pleasure. Yeah, so uh, I'm excited to have you here because there's just a lot going on in the news right now around NATO, um, and I felt who better to talk us through this than you. Of course, I'm talking about the fact that former President Trump turned candidate Trump was in South Carolina at a campaign rally this weekend, and during that rally, he made comments about the fact that if he were to become president, he would not support the nations, the Western nations, that did not fulfill their obligations, their financial obligations to NATO. So first, I just want to ask you, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, he said something a little more uh, incendiary than that. Uh, he said that um, those for those countries uh, that did not, uh, that refused uh, to pay for their own self-defense adequately, um, that he would tell the Russians to do whatever the hell they wanted. Um, and and you can imagine, I mean, you know, Trump has this incredible knack of of saying the kind of things that really, really incense his his opponents, his adversaries, um, and in this case, some allies, uh, the Europeans. Um, and they are panicking about it. And the NATO Secretary General and the European Council President predictably said that this is the kind of thing that gives comfort to Putin. It exactly, you know, strengthens him. And and I accept all of that. But of course, the media stopped there because the media is only looking to like put this in the headline box of oh, we found another incredible thing that we can embarrass Trump with. And and there is another side of the story, of course, which is that the Europeans and indeed a majority of U.S. allies in NATO um, continue to not live up to their stated commitments of defense expenditure per their piece of GDP. Um, they've been long committed to reaching a 2% target, which is well under what the Americans spend. And, and that's leaving aside the fact that the U.S. has a much bigger economy, but just the percentage of GDP. I mean, the Canadians, for example, spend 1.29% of GDP, which is roughly what they spent in the 90s, despite, despite long commitments to get to 2%. And so the question that should be asked, which is never asked, which is, well, if you're an ally of the United States and you consistently refuse to spend money on your own self-defense, should there be any consequences for that whatsoever? Any, any. Uh, because, I, I mean, I think the European and the Canadian perspective is, no, nope, you should just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, it does strike me that um, it is the fact that the United States has not taken this seriously. Um, and, you know, maybe the U.S. should say this means you won't get the same level of intelligence. Or maybe it means that the U.S. won't do the same level of military exercises. Or maybe they won't station the same number of troops on your territory. Maybe maybe they won't um, you know, allow you to buy the same advanced, uh, you know, sort of military equipment so me, that the Americans yeah. produce. So let know? me ask you this. Why yeah. aren't those nations paying that part of their obligation? Why aren't they paying that 2% of GDP or somewhere close to that? What do you think is going on? Well, some of them are. Uh, and the ones that are tend to be the ones that are frontline facing adversaries. So the Baltic states do. Tiny countries, but they're spending a lot. Uh, as a percentage of their GDP. And they're also spending a lot more as a percentage of the GDP in providing aid to the Ukrainians than the Americans are. The Polish government, same. And they've been taking huge numbers of Ukrainian refugees, in many cases in their homes, which the Americans are not, uh, and the Nordic countries. So what do those countries have in common? They're frontline states facing Russia. What about the countries that aren't spending that money? The Germans, the Italians, the Spaniards, the Canadians. Well, the one thing they have in common is they're far away. But another thing they have in common is that the Americans haven't done anything about it. Um, and and I, I want to be clear. 
I don't think it's, I mean, what, because, you know, if you take Trump at face value, you know, you seem to be saying that literally if you don't pay 2%, so if, if the Russians decide that they want to illegally annex a component of your territory, that the United States should not, should be indifferent, mm -hmm. should not care. And I, I think that is an unreasonable position. I, I, even if that's just a bargaining tactic, that should be a private, that's an inside voice bargaining tactic. That's not an outside voice bargaining tactic. But it, it is true that the, the, the President Trump is much more comfortable with um, a, an ally like Saudi Arabia than he is with an ally like the Germans, because the Germans, like they have the, they support rule of law and democracy, and they have these common values with the Americans, and 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 they think that really means something. And and Trump is like, first of all, I don't really care about those values much to begin with. And even if I did, I wouldn't let you drive a harder bargain with me on the basis of this. I mean, Trump is like a real estate guy. For him, it's it's like a landlord's relationship with your tenant. Like you don't care. Like if you like that tenant or you don't, if they don't pay their rent, they're going to be evicted, right? That That is his perspective. And the Saudis are like, okay, they may not be democratic. Um, they may be a dictatorship. Maybe they torture folks every once in a while, but they pay their bills. And in fact, they've got a really big checkbook.